What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to my social life is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly, and today we're joined by Jordan McDonald. And Jordan is a photographer and videographer based in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. I'm very excited to have him here on the podcast today. Jordan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jacob. It's my pleasure, man. So where I want to start, I want to go, I want to go all the way back. Yeah, do so it. So let's go back to high school. Yeah. Okay. Where, where you started. So ultimately it was like a school project, I believe, that led to a company. Yeah, exactly. So it was uh, it was actually a grade 11 course um, and videography was just offered. I was lucky enough to have that at my school. And uh, yeah, it, it kind of started with us creating like our group for that project or for this for this class. And yeah, we just started doing it in that class and we loved it. And it, it spurred from that. I, yeah, that's where it started. Yeah. And then so it was through that project then where like teachers were impressed with your work and they started getting you to make videos, right? Yeah, it started with, um, we we were supposed to make videos every two weeks based on something that we learned in the class or, or um, like, a, like a topic of some sort. Um, but at one point we stopped doing that and we um, just did a, a short film. And after that was done, we actually had like gotten pretty good reviews on it from, from the whole school. And teachers started getting us to do assembly videos, um, all different kinds of things for like charities that were going on. And that's when it kind of took off to where teachers started even asking us, hey, can you do this um, for my friend, but they'll pay you. Um, and that kind of launched everything. And, and it start, all started with that one class. Do you, do you remember the first paid gig? First paid gig? I don't, I don't, I don't. I, like the first, it probably would have, we actually did a, something very early with uh, the Jumpstart campaign, like with uh, Canadian Tire, which was really, really fun. Um, so that that's like one of the only things when, you know, you, when you go into a store and they ask if you want to donate, I'll donate to that because I saw firsthand where it's going. And, uh, but yeah, that was one of the first campaigns that we, we that we did for money. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it was really cool. And it's like talking about the extent of the company. So the company ultimately you guys named it Tacklebox, right? We did. That was after a... Um, a mixtape by the cool kids which was our favorite group at the time um and that's like they had just recently uh, released that tape and so that's why we called it that okay how, how many people were like in the company it started out as uh three or four people um and it grew as large as seven i think um and yeah yeah it was it was pretty cool but it started with a core three of us that were in that one production class and we were all in the group together and it just progressed yeah that's great. It's like uh, talking about like the extent of the company, like how, how big, did, like not how big did it get, but like, could you have in theory done it as a full-time job? Like, were you guys pulling that much? Or? I, I think that if we really doubled down on everything, it, it, it was, it would have been something that I could have just done forever. Um, one of the issues that we ran into was that we all went away for school. Um, so there was one of us like I stayed in Ottawa. Um, my other friend was out on the East Coast and my other friend um, w was in Toronto. Um, so we were all doing things for the company individually, but I feel like if we were all together, it would have been something that would have worked. Was there ever a conversation to kind of try and all stick together and do it? Like, because people go to school to try and get a job, but you guys had a company that was successful and had the potential to become like your full-time thing. Like, was that ever a conversation of maybe we should put school off for a year or two and really see what we can do with this? I don't know. I, I don't, not that I remember. Um, it probably would have been wise to do something like that. But in like, I mean, in, in hindsight, I'd, I'd love to change a lot of things. Um, it would have been something worth looking into for sure, because I think it, it could have been a viable career opportunity. Um, it's just something we didn't talk about. Is yeah. it, is it still something like you do today or is tackle box, tackle box pretty much for all Taco Box is uh, like it still exists and it still it takes on work and stuff like that. It it's not something I'm heavily involved with, but whenever I have like a client or something like that, I'll pass it along, kind of thing. Um, I haven't filmed a video for Taco Box in probably two years or something like that. Okay, yeah, that's fair. But so like, why why do you say in hindsight it would have been a good thing to look into? Um, because I feel like it is something that I could have done, and, and it would have been something that I really enjoyed as a career. Uh, and I think if we, we did have that conversation and we did end up pooling all of our resources together in, in one city, um, we could have made something out, out of it that would have progressed into a full-time job and a full-time job only. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I think for anyone that knows you or that fo- not many knows but follows you on Instagram, yeah. starting this conversation with video might kind of throw them off a little bit. Definitely. Because like looking at your Instagram, it's all photo. I don't have any video on yeah. my Instagram. Yeah. Why is that? Um, I do a lot of work like curating my feed. Um, and w- one of the major reasons is that it just doesn't go usually. Um, so, so that's the main reason. But number two, I kind of just stopped doing video for, for quite a while. Uh, mostly because I didn't enjoy it anymore once I started doing it for for money. Um, but I am starting to get back into it, and we we are definitely going to get back going on it. I don't know yet how I'm going to start releasing it and if I'm going to do that on my Instagram, uh, but it's coming. It's coming for sure. Yeah? Yeah, it is. That's awesome. I was going to say, because I know I found your YouTube channel has a couple of videos on it. It does. So you're definitely, I saw a couple new videos coming from you. Yeah, and, so. and, and those kind of like helped um, bring back my love for, for creating videos and stuff like that. So... Uh, like that, that definitely helped. And that would, so those were not paid projects. Like those were things that I did because I wanted to do them. And, uh, it, it reminded me that doing video is still fun. I just, I have to do it like under my own terms, I think. Yeah. But so talk to me about like that point you made where you kind of fell out of love with video once you started to get paid for it. Why do you, why do you think that is? I think it was because I was at the beck and call of other people. Um, and I at least feel that in, uh, I mean, creative fields in general, not necessarily just video. There's a lot of um, disjointed communication between people. There's a huge communication gap. And I I just, I didn't enjoy it. Um, There'd be times where people would would ask for something and I would give it to them, but they'd come back with six to eight revisions. And I know you know probably what that's like. And it's just, after a while, and especially with video, it's quite a bit of work. Um, it just got tiring and, and that kind of made me lose my love for it. Um, so like creating under my own terms has always been something I enjoy. Um, and with those two videos that I released, like that's why I did them. But, um, yeah, videos for other people is just not something that I love anymore. I bet like, especially cause I've never done videos like a project or a paid mm-hmm. project or anything, but I can imagine if you like six to eight edits at one time, like that's so many tweaks, but like you have the video flowing in a certain way, like maybe it's cut to the it's music a in a certain way. Like, so you make one tweak, you have to redo a bunch of things, right? The, yeah, the one thing too would, would be um, people just don't like, and credit to them, like they've never done it, so they don't they don't get it. But they would ask for a change, like, oh, can you change the music? And they think that 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 is the easiest thing ever. Um, but I edit everything to music, so as soon as I change the music, I have to like change every single clip that goes in it. And people just don't know, so yeah. I, like that's not their fault necessarily. Um, but I, 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 the dealing with the communication gap just got a little overwhelming for me at at the time. Yeah, but so you said like you're starting to get back into video. Is that just more so as like a, a passion thing and doing exactly. it for fun? Like you're not going to explore doing it for money right now? Not yet. I think I'm going to try and get back into it like on on my own terms. And then after that, explore doing like dabble a little bit into into paid video for sure. And then so when did you kind of start taking still photos then? Like when did that start? So that was so that was when I was still doing work with Tacklebox. Um, So at the time we had a7s cameras, which are just like a like a Sony mirrorless camera that does well for video, like slow motion, night night stuff, all that kind of all that good stuff. but I bought my own camera as like a supplementary side camera that I could take if we needed an extra camera. And it was a Sony a7 II, um, which did photo and video. And at the time I, like, I had a few friends that were into photography and since my camera could take photos and pretty well, I decided to just start taking photos. There, I don't have any illustrious story about, about it it's just i got a camera it did both and i was like well i i should probably make use of it and now i do it more than i do video yeah i was gonna say do you think part of the reason why you do it more is at the time when you were doing both you're doing photo and video do you think part of the reason you started to gravitate more towards photography was because of that aspect of all the reasons you fell out of love with video because with photography it was just like your own thing you didn't have to worry about anyone else totally like a hundred percent and that's kind of for for a lot of people that don't know me um i don't typically do photos for money mm-hmm. and the reason i don't is because i don't want it to be the same as what happened with video that's interesting do you, yeah. get, do you get asked a lot to do paid stuff um yeah quite a bit um it, like it depends sometimes i will do it but it's very 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 rare mm-hmm. um it also lets me pick and choose who i work with because i can just say that i i just don't i don't want i don't work for money yeah. um so 
yeah, that's just, that's just how it is. I just don't want to lose the love for it mm -hmm. because right now I love it. Um, and yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get back that love for video too. I'm always curious when someone does photo and video, what is easier to tell a story with? I think video. Yeah. Cause you can have like a, <clears throat> excuse me, you can have like a, a dialogue and I don't know. I think it's, it's more visual. Like a, a video is thousands of images put together in, into one clip. Whereas a photo is just, just one image. And, and there are people that are incredible at telling stories through photo. But if you're comparing the two, I think video for sure. Video? Yeah. That's fair. Is there like, when it comes to your photography style, mm -hmm. you have a very like, I don't want to say like unique style, like yeah. it's different from anyone else that I really follow. Yeah. How did you kind of come to that style? Cause like that's especially for someone, people starting photography, like trying to find their style is tough. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I did photography for a little, little bit and kind of what I did was like, I would almost try to mimic other people's styles. Okay. And through that, like also, but by doing that, learning how to edit yeah. and figuring out like what I like, what I don't like to kind of craft my own style. Like mm -hmm. how did you kind of come up with yours? Um, so what it's kind of always been evolving for over the past three years that I've been doing photography. Um, but w the distinct moment of when I realized I needed to get a style was when I was with two of my friends who were also photographers. Um, and when I started in photography, I, I started editing all of my photos in Photoshop and not Lightroom. Um, so that was just something that I didn't know. Um, and I began doing that. And one of my friends, I went for lunch with him and he, he told me specifically, if you want to um, progress in photography, you have to one, develop a style and two, stop editing in Photoshop. Um, so he told me that and, and for a while I experimented with my style. Um, and I, I think it just came like the one that I have now just came from what I like to see in other people's photos. So I just pull from different people, um, from like Alan Palander, from Ryan Howard, um, a bunch of different people. And yeah, it just kind of, I've kind of settled in and I think I'm good with where I am now. Yeah. And I, I'm saying that because I don't want to change my feed now. It's, it's, it's fine the way it is and, and I'm good with it. I like it. Why, why shouldn't you edit in Photoshop? Cause like just part, that's just a personal question for me because I edit in Photoshop. I'm just more comfortable yeah. there and I, I'm able to edit better and like in Photoshop, like what, why is Lightroom more superior, like superior? That's totally fair. And like, not to say that I don't edit in Photoshop, I bring the photos over after sometimes, um, for me, a lot of my stuff and the way that I put things together is for like that aesthetically pleasing feed. Um, and using presets and stuff like that in Lightroom is just the, the, the thing that makes that happen. So it's, it's, it's more about having a consistent look and I just find that super easy to do in Lightroom. I mean, I'm sure you could do that in Photoshop, but I, like just the, the, the ease of doing it is, is, is something that I'm comfortable with. Yeah. And talk to me about like putting that grid together. Yeah. It's like, how many photos do you think that you take that actually make it on Instagram? And like, is there a type of like, because now you have this style and this look and aesthetic on Instagram, mm -hmm. does that limit you almost creatively because so you much. can't take certain types of photos? So much. Um, not even with the like, you can't, I can't take them um, because I, f I, I always just take them just in case, just to see. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I would say the amount of photos that make it to my feed is probably less than 1% or 2% maybe. It's, it's, it's small it, and, and, and the, like the amount that I love that still don't make it is still pretty high. Like I have probably, I don't know, hundred to 150 photos that I just sit on and occasionally I'll chuck it in to see if it works, but probably won't ever post them. Really? Yeah. Just cause they don't fit the feed or yeah, yeah really? I'm, I'm really sticking to, yeah. I'm really sticking to the feed. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it, like it's it's good because it looks good and people will comment on it all the time. I mean, you're, we're talking about it now, which, which is pretty cool. But at the same time, um, I, I don't have the ability to post a bunch of photos that I do really love. Uh, so I have a, I have a, like a second, like personal account for that. And sometimes I'll, I'll share them, but I'm also reluctant to share some of them because I'm like, well, if, if I can ever end up posting these, then I should not post them on my burner account. Yeah. And so, so. like, like what so what do you do with the like all so you said less than one percent of your photos make yeah. it to instagram what do you do with that other 999 or 99.5 percent? i totally don't know what i was trying to say but what do you do with the rest of those photos that don't make it to instagram delete them or they just sit on my computer and exist yeah occasionally i'll cycle through them um and i've actually been meaning to to like 
delete a bunch of them. But uh, yeah, they they just sit there on my computer. That's, unfortunately, yeah. yeah. Would you ever like sell prints or anything like that, or does that even get it that gets into like it becomes a money thing again? I've I've been asked about one prints and two um, selling some of my photos like for stock. Um, prints I'm for and stock not necessarily. I think prints is a form of flattery for me because if people are putting my stuff up in their home, uh, that kind of like brings a sense of happiness to me. So um, it's less about doing work for people and more like I just have to create a couple of different sets of images and then they just pick what they want. Mm -hmm. No extra work for me. Um, and it's kind of on my own terms still, I think. But um, selling my photos for stock is something that I, I'm pretty against. I, I, I'm very about doing it for, for myself. And the idea of somebody else using my image without, well, I mean, they'd have my permission technically, but using it for whatever they want after they pay the, the money is, is kind of unsettling to me. I want to know where my photos are at all times. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no, I get that. But I also want, I want to just double back quickly sure. when you're talking about like finding your style and everything course, yeah. and how like you've changed it and you finally found one that you like. Yeah. Looking back, is there anything that you're like, I can't believe I used to edit my photos like that. Yeah, you should see about probably two years ago when I was overseas in Europe and uh, I was editing my photos and I would bump up the highlights and the and the whites and the 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 skies would just be like blown out. And I can't believe I edited like that, but it's still up on my page to humble me and remind me that I did progress this far and hopefully I continue to progress. Um, yeah, there's a lot of bad, bad edits. Yeah. But speaking of like progressing with, it's kind of like contradictory because you don't want to change your style, but you want to progress. So do you feel like by trying to stick with that style on mm -hmm. Instagram, you're almost limiting yourself creatively to some degree? I think um, progression now for me is going to be less about um, style and now more about composition um, and the types of photos that I take and not necessarily how I edit them. Because I think I've kind of gotten to the point where where editing is quick and easy for me. Um, but I think I need to start setting myself up better with better shots, better raw images. Um, and that's that's what I'm going to be working on next. I think you're right in, in terms of progression for editing my photos. I'm kind of at a standstill, although I know there's a lot more to learn. Um, but but setting myself up in with, with better raw images is what I'm going to do next. OK. Yeah. And I wanted to ask, too, because when I was going through your feed and everything, you've collaborated or like taken photos of mm -hmm. some huge Instagram models. Like I went back like a couple of years ago and you're the girl that you were taking photos with has like 600 K on Instagram now. Which one was that? Um, I think remember? it was like in Australia or something. I could be wrong. It was on a beach. Huh. I can't remember. That's okay. I'll show you. I'll show you. After. Yeah, definitely show me. But like, how do you like, even like I obviously, I know how you met with Joy Kidney, but like, how do you connect with some people with like huge Instagram followings to collaborate with? Um, it's, it's a lot of shooting your shot, man. Um, I have, I've had to become okay with people either not replying or just straight up saying no. And to me, people saying no is almost better than not having them reply at all. I think it just, it opens up your DMs, right? And like, that means you, that you can reach out to them later. Um, and hopefully when you progress, they see your progression and notice that you've been putting in the work. And, and, and I mean, like, yeah, it, I kind of have just had to accept the no's. Yeah. It, and, it, and it happens a lot, like more than people think. I reach out to so many people when I travel, but uh, I only end up getting responses from 10% of them, maybe. Yeah. Um, but it pays off for the people that do reply because it ends up being bigger people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. It's like when you meet up with these models, like mm -hmm. talking about that, that process of like organizing a shoot with them. Because that's something when I did photography, I never did because I was like, yeah. I have no idea. Like, how do you do? You, like, do you have to help them? Like, tell them where the location is going to be, so they can pick an outfit, or like, how does that look? It depends on the city. Um, so, for example, if I've been there before, I help as much as I can with picking locations, um, picking times, like where we're going to go, um, all that kind of stuff. But for cities that I've never been, I kind of have to try to ask them for help. Or what I'll do is, if I have a friend in the city, I'll get them to help and make me seem more prepared at least. I'm kind of like you, where I don't, I'm not the best at planning. So um, that's something I've struggled with. And especially going to LA, I needed to become more um, prepared. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's just a lot of 
back and forth coordination because I'm not always able to go location scout from my computer in Ottawa. And do you like, do you pose your models or anything or do you, do they usually know what they're doing? A little bit of both. Like I'll, I'll, when I, when I come into a shoot, like I'll, I'll have uh, like a saved folder of stuff that I will send them before. Um, and it's usually like filled with a bunch of poses that I want to do, but there will be times in shoots where uh, I go, Oh, that's actually really cool. Can you hold that there? Or like I'll position them in, in certain ways. But um, it, I've shot with a lot of people that don't actually model and they kind of just like, having their photo taken and I've shot with a lot of people that are legitimate models and it and it really helps having people that have done it before not to say that you shouldn't try it for the first time but um, just because they do poses without me having me having to say anything um, and that helps a lot like a lot as you're kind of talking there I'm picturing like as you're doing this I'm picturing like you doing stuff for Instagram so do you mm -hmm. think with Instagram now you're not shooting for photography, you're shooting for Instagram and that changes the creative process at all? A little bit. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I've not, I've never thought about it like that, but definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how, what else to comment on that, but yeah. like you're, you're right. I don't have any like disputes on that. I think you're right. That's fair. I was going to ask too, when it comes to working with models and stuff, yeah. where do you land on with crediting? This is a question you should ask really early in my podcast. Sure. I've kind of gotten away from it, but I want to go back. Like, are you big on tagging you in the photo or do you prefer in the comments or the caption? I'll or? do, I'll do usually, um, tagging her in the photo. So I'm in like, sorry, other way, like when you, so you oh, send when, the model what, photo, what like, yeah. Me? How do you feel about that? Like, where do you land? I'm impartial as long as it happens. Um, like if, if they want to tag me in the comments or they want to tag me in the picture, it doesn't matter to me, but I get upset if they, I don't get tagged at all, which I don't even think has happened, but yeah. So they tag, like that you've never had a situation like that where you don't get tagged. No, I think I've, it's actually happened one time when I did a video for somebody. Oh, really? Yeah. And they, they released a video and didn't end up putting me in the comments or the caption or anything like that until four hours after it launched. And by that time, yeah, you know, it wasn't as impactful. Does it differ when it comes to crediting if it's a paid gig versus an unpaid gig? Do you think like if someone's paying you for it? Yeah, I, I, I'm not. A, I'm not really that upset if if somebody pays me and they don't. Um, it's still nice, obviously, and I would love it, but I, I'm not going to get upset if, if that happens. If I'm doing something for free, I do get upset. It's like it's like a form of payment almost. Mm -hmm even though it's not kind of yeah we're getting into that like i'll pay you with exposure yeah. territory but it, it's it's like with me i don't think i can complain because i don't really do it for money mm -hmm. so the exposure is nice um but at the same time it's not really payment either yeah like it's a tough spot for me because i, I can't be hypocritical and say um like that i want to do it for money because i don't mm -hmm. That's fair. And earlier when we were talking about kind of like your style and stuff, yeah. you mentioned Alan Palander. I did. And yeah. I actually got the chance to meet him. So can you tell us? I about? did. Yeah. So Alan um, is actually a very good person with replying to messages on Instagram. So I, I had messaged him a couple of times before and he's very attentive, like responsive, all that kind of stuff. And I saw one time that he was in Ottawa um, and I just shot him a message and I said, Hey, Alan, I know you're super busy and probably can't shoot, but if you have time to go for a drink or a coffee, love to pick your brain. And he got back to me and he said, um, we're super busy and don't have time to shoot, but um, I'm editing in the lobby of the Chateau Laurier. If you want to come by and come chill with us, we're just going to be here for the next like four or five hours. I hopped in my car so fast <laughs> and got right down there, parked and went and I hung out with him for like two hours and it was very, very cool. He was a very nice guy. Do, do you remember some of the things you guys talked about? One of the things that he really put into perspective for me was um, the gap in, in talent, I guess, and how far I really had to go. At that time, I, I thought I had progressed so far and I was at a point where I was happy with my work. But it made me realize very quickly that that there's a whole another level to to creative work, and I mean he was at that level. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. He he was working on a a trailer for his uh, YouTube at the time, and they were trying to pick shots for it. And I remember um, he he was showing his buddy the shots, and I thought they're probably the coolest shots I've ever seen. But they were just I don't I don't want that. It's not good enough. And I was I was sitting there 
with my mind blown, I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Like that would be the main shot I would use in my video. And then we had a whole conversation about that, but it was a lot about the talent gap yeah. that I still had to go for myself. It's like, what are some of those things that separate you guys? Like when it comes to that talent gap? Um, I think, um, a, a lot of the stuff that he talked about was somebody can be consistent, but that might not make them good. It, it might make them good for like a, like a work, um, project, but if, if for taking inspiration from people and, and trying to work on something that's difficult, um, those people aren't always the best. Like they're, they're in their comfort zone and that's great because it works for them. But um, finding inspiration from people that do stuff that's hard is harder to find than I thought. And he, he put that into perspective for me, like, like a lot. So. And yeah. like talking to me, you mentioned earlier, and you kind of mentioned it with Alan, the importance of shooting your shot. And mm -hmm. like, just like you shot that DM out on a whim and then you jumped in your car and drove across the city. Like talk to me about doing that. Cause I feel like not enough people yeah, of course. So I, I used to work at a company called Canvas Pop, which is um, a photo printing company in the Ottawa area. And at the time, my um, the co-founder of the company, who was my boss, kind of technically, um, told me that he wanted to, me to reach out to a certain number of people every month and get used to one, not getting replies um, and two, uh, seeing how often it does happen. Um, and the first person that said yes to me was um, the lead designer of Nike at the time. And um, his name is Jason Maiden, super amazing guy. But I, having gone through that now, now I applied that to, to Instagram and reaching out to models and it's done wonders for, for collaborating with people because you never know until you try. And people think that uh, these, this person has 400,000 followers, they're never gonna reply to me. Well, a lot of them won't, but some of them do. And when they do, it's it's worth it. And what did you talk to the Nike designer about then? Um, at the time, I was 21 years old, um, and he was actually the youngest um, or the first ever Nike intern or, or design intern at Nike. And so it was a lot of how he became successful at such a, such a young age and how I could apply that when moving forward in my career. Um, yes, yeah, so we talked a lot about ageism and how people are surprised when younger people are doing really, really cool stuff. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was a more of a fun and flowing conversation. It, it, there was nothing serious. It was, yeah, it was a lot about creative work. I feel like that's the thing that would probably like scare a lot of people in that mm -hmm. situation where shooting your shot is one thing, but once they say, yeah, for sure, I'll jump on a call. And then you're like, Sh shit, what do I, what I do I ask? A lot of preparation for that. So he actually had a, a ton of videos online because he's he's done like TED Talks. He's done a bunch of really cool talks um, at Nike and, and all this other stuff. Um, so I what I did was I went through and researched all that stuff and made sure I didn't ask any of those questions. Um, so I asked a lot of questions that were specific to me at the time, like how people perceive you when you're young and doing creative work. Um, yeah, and I just made sure I didn't repeat anything that he obviously repeats all the time. So it, it was a lot of preparation. Like I spent a, probably a full day worth of going through his stuff and making sure that I didn't ask the same things. Mm -hmm. And are you still doing that? Like not in the Instagram model sphere, but more so kind of like just in terms of like picking people's brains and getting to know people. Do I still do. do um, and I'm what I'm trying to do now is, well, one, um, continue doing that for larger scale people and, and companies and stuff like that, but also trying to meet more people in Ottawa. Like that's how we met. Um, I'm just, I'm just trying to get out there in, in the community as well. Um, Cause I feel like it's one thing to have a 30 minute conversation with the lead designer of Nike. Um, and that's cool, but it lasts 30 minutes. Um, and I won't be able to talk to him every day after that. I could text you tomorrow and ask you about something and you would reply right away. So I think it's like, um, building relationships that you can uh, call on more actively is something that I want to continue to do because honestly, I've been pretty shy um, in, in Ottawa in general and haven't really put myself out there. And I think that's one thing that I want to start doing more, like applying that concept, but more locally. Why do you think you were shy before? Was it just like, just like a natural thing or was there yeah. any specific reasons? Uh, no, not, nothing in particular. It was just, I didn't see the need for it, but now that I do, 
um, it's it's something that I, I I would I just get over my shyness. Like yeah. I already see the benefit um, from doing stuff like this. So no, that's fair. Yeah. And then so like because speaking of like being shy too, you weren't too heavy like. You didn't focus on trying to grow your Instagram or use it to grow your personal brand beforehand mm -hmm. either, right? No, not really. It was kind of just a place to put photos. Put photos? Yeah. Yeah. Why was there ever a thought to try and like grow it or anything? Because like I know you've collabed with other photographers that have huge followings. Mm -hmm. Like was that ever an idea? You Just not really something you really cared about? Honestly, it's... I don't really care about the number of followers I have um, from a business standpoint. As of right now, I care about it because I want the most amount of people possible to see my photos. Um, and if that means that there's more people that are willing to buy my prints or whatever else I'm selling, amazing. But I'm not really concerned about that. I just want the maximum number of people to to pay attention. That's fair. Yeah. And I want to talk about your travel experience. Let's do it. So I know you've done quite a bit of travel. I have, yeah. Don't tell my parents. <laughs> <laughs> but you also, you also, and a big reason as to why you could do so much that travels because you moved to England, right? I did, yeah. And so I think it's cool because, so you moved to England for school. I did. But I think what was really interesting when I first, when we first kind of met up and we were talking about it, you told me that you had the opportunity to stay in residence mm -hmm. when your first year and your parents were going to pay for it. Yeah. But you opted, you told them you didn't want that and you'd rather them, if they were still willing to, to contribute that, contribute that money for you to move and like study abroad. Exactly. How did you have that kind of like that foresight, I think that's the right use of that word, I could mm -hmm. be wrong, that foresight to kind of make that decision like early on into university, like why was that something that was important to you? Well, I, I, I've i always loved traveling, like I am pretty blessed in terms of being able to have traveled before that, but it was before mostly about um, like going on tropical vacations and stuff like that. And that was mostly because I wasn't into photography at the time, um, but, I I had known for a while that I really liked the city of London, sorry, um, and the country of England. Um, so it was kind of just a, I, I had started saving for it when I was in high school and kind of saved all throughout university and knew it was going to happen. And um, I was just upfront and honest with my, with my parents right, right from the get-go. Like, hey, I know that uh, you want me to try and experience university, but at the time I was shy too. I, didn't really care to be in residence. Mm -hmm. um, and I just said, I'd rather you can, yeah, I'd rather you contribute that to me being in England instead. Mm -hmm. So it, it was kind of, it was kind of just a, I always knew, like once I started traveling, I wanted to keep traveling. Mm -hmm. And I'm just fortunate enough to have done that at a younger age. And so how was the experience of living in England? It's very, it's very different than just traveling there mm -hmm. for, I mean, that's the same about any place, but, um, it, for the first three or four days, it was really tough. And I questioned why I did it for those three or four days. Um, but after that, it was the time of my life for sure. Yeah. How did you push through those three or four days? Knowing that I could just call my family was really easy. Um, I hopped on FaceTime when I got there. Like, I guess technology is making it so easy for me to realize, yeah, I mean, I'm a couple thousand kilometers away from my family, but I can call them at any time I want. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was easy like that. And from that whole experience, what are kind of like your three biggest like learnings? Cause I know like you said the school was great, but it's not like you were learning a ton at school and it was kind of no. knowledge you gained outside of the classrooms. Like what are like probably some like the three biggest lessons you learned during that time? So I think one of the things that I, I was, I kind of learned a lot of stuff near the end and afterwards looking back and didn't realize I was learning at the time. Um, London and I mean, I guess Southern England in general is a place of opportunity. So I really took advantage of the time that I had there. Um, and because school wasn't the most learning focused environment for me, creatively at least, um, I spent a lot of my time trying to work on creative projects with other people. So there was a couple of times where I traveled to London to um, assist on a shoot for Adidas. I did that one time. Um, I had the opportunity to go and do a, an Instagram meetup with, with other photographers in London. So it was just, um, I don't know, even know if it was necessarily one, like three specific things, but it was being able to surround myself with these opportunities and these people and knowing 
that I had to take advantage of them in order to take advantage of my time there in general. Um, that all helped me learn so much. And I don't think there's three things that I could pinpoint. I know that's a cop out, but that's fair though. It's true. Did the Adidas thing come through to shooting your shot or how did that happen? Yeah, it was just through um, a guy named Matt that I follow and he did um, photos for my favorite soccer players. Mm. Um, and I just reached out to him and said, hey man, love your work. If you ever need help on a shoot, let me know. And he was doing one for Adidas. So he just told me to come along, did some behind the scenes like photography for it. So that's awesome. Yeah. I want to talk about too how you said like you knew you had to start taking advantage of these opportunities to yeah. take advantage of that time. Yeah. So overall, I'm always curious, like what is your relationship like with time? Do you operate as if we don't have a lot of time or do you operate as if you have a lot of time left and you're taking things not necessarily slowly, but you're being patient with your time? Like what's your relationship like with time? I try to make use of every second of it. Honestly, I hate being busy. Like I hate it, but I am all the time busy. Um, just because I feel like when I'm not, I am wasting my time and I could be progressing and other people are probably progressing more than me when I'm just sitting there and doing nothing. Um, so I do hate being busy, but I hate feeling unproductive more than I hate being busy. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Not until I get, I get what you're saying. Like it would be nice to hang out and chill on a beach every day for the rest of my life, but then I wouldn't be like as good as I am at photography mm -hmm. and continue to be growing. And so how does travel then fit into that equation of always wanting to be busy, but also enjoying the free time? Like when you're traveling to you, is that being busy or is that? It's not, it's usually not a vacation, uh, to be honest with you. So when I'm traveling, it's, it's, um, a lot of planned things happen, um, when I'm there. So like when I went to England the last time I did, I think five portrait shoots, then I met up with two different photography people um, in London. And then I did a bunch of other stuff too, but it was pretty much go, go, go. Same with LA. Um, we were four people, so we all had different plans, but all tried to stay together and do each other's plans with each other. Um, so it's always go, go, go. And my vacations are not really vacations. Yeah. So. And so how many, like you just mentioned LA, you said England, how many countries have you been to now? I don't know, I'm not sure. Really? Probably, if I had to guess, like 15 to 20. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So not a crazy amount, but like yeah. good. Yeah. That's a size more than a lot of people. Yeah, that's true. I'm fortunate and I'm, I'm thankful for that. And so why is travel so important to you? Um, for me, I think it's sometimes it's good to reset, obviously from a mental standpoint. And um, I also think that it's, it's good to challenge yourself and put yourself in new settings. Like... London and being around that area helped develop my style quite a bit. And I think if I hadn't gone there, it wouldn't, my feed would not look the way it is, the way it does now. So, um, having gone there, I'm, I'm grateful. And I think if I can learn stuff going to all these different places, I should probably keep going there. <laughs> That's at least my thought process for it. So do you have, I'm always curious. I love when people travel all the time. I love to hear crazy travel stories. Mm -hmm. The one caveat with your answer is it <laughs> can involve urban exploration. Cause we're going to talk about that after. Okay. Um, do you want Europe or do you want where, what, story, what kind of stories do you want? Any, any, like any story of you traveling where you got into a sticky situation or something crazy happened or lost a passport or just anything crazy that's happened in your travels. I've lost my phone a few times. Um, but it, one one crazy one was uh, we when we were in Germany. Um, I went to Berlin on a weekend with my friend Omar, and um, on day two of three, we didn't really have anything to do, and he knew that I wanted to go to this bridge, and this bridge was is pretty famous on Instagram. It's a, like a semicircle, um, but the water reflection underneath it creates a full circle. Is it like in the forest? Yeah. Okay, I know exactly what yeah. you're talking about. So that had been like on my bucket list of shooting items for, for a long time, and he knew that. Um, but I was kind of reluctant to go to this place because it costed a lot of money to get there from Berlin. It was in like the eastern corner of Germany. Um, but he said, we're not going to be around here anytime soon ever again. Um, so let's just go and do it. So we ended up paying the money and uh, taking two trains and a bus to get to this national park. Um, took photos there, it was really fun. And we kind of just chilled there for like an hour, took in the rest of the, the park and stuff like that. Um, but we went, when we were done, we went to go back to 
the bus stop. And when we got to the bus stop, we looked at the times and the, the bus came three times a day. So we were like, oh my God. And our trains back were in like two hours and the, the next bus didn't come for three hours. So we were just screwed. So we literally walked through the back country of Germany to get back to the train station. Um, so we were walking through people's backyards, like random farm fields. We didn't really know where we were going. We just kind of walked in the direction of, uh, of the train tracks to start. Um, and then we had a map, but we didn't have any directional, look, like we didn't know where we were. So we just guessed and we eventually got back. Wow, that's crazy. So that was fun. Yeah. Yeah. And we got back to the town and like, so the way that it worked was as soon as we got off the, um, bus when we got there, uh, sorry, when we got off the train, when we got there, the bus was right there. So we didn't see the rest of the town and what people's homes were looking like and stuff. But when we got closer to the town, having walked through all these farm fields and stuff, um, we kind of walked through the, I say urbanized, but there's only 2000 people there. So, um, where the homes were and stuff like that. And people could tell that we weren't from there a hundred percent. We were walking through there and people were giving us the weirdest looks and we didn't look any different, but people knew that we were not from there. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was pretty funny and nobody, not a single person spoke a word of English because we were so far outside of like the main mm -hmm. city. We actually ended up having time to go eat after that. And, um, when we went to order our food, like I just had to point at something and hope it was good because they didn't know how to speak English. I didn't know how to speak German. Um, so that was fun. The whole experience is great because we made it and it's good, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it could have went very poorly. Yeah. Uh, and actually on the way home from that, we um, got stopped by a ticket officer saying that even though we bought mobile tickets, we had to print it out, but this guy only spoke German. So we were like trying to communicate with him through Google Translate on my phone. And that was interesting too. Yeah. So, I mean, it, the whole, it was a whole whirlwind of an experience, but I'm so happy that I did it. The photos turned out great. And uh, it's something that I can talk about now. It's, it's yeah, pretty fun. It's quite the day. Yeah, it was, it was a whirlwind for sure. Do you have any other bucket list shots? Oh, um, not really. I mean, like maybe bucket list uh, people to work with, but not not necessarily places or or anything like that. There's a there's a few, but it would require like security clearance to get to. Like I, I always wanted to do a shoot on a airport runway, but obviously like that, that's super unrealistic until I make it. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be tough to pull yeah. that off yeah. um, beforehand. But so, like, so nothing, nothing like that's doable right now. Yeah, but what are some of those things that like? Play with me on this here for a minute, like I, blue uh, sky. I also really want to eventually get into shooting um, for for soccer teams in in like London, wherever. I want to. I I follow one guy that does it really well for a team called Paris Saint Germain. Mm -hmm. um, I love it, and I want to do the same sort of thing, but for my favorite team, ideally. Um, but that's that's bucket list too for sure. I I I really try to get into the Raptors and try to try to do that too, but because of how good they were last year was not a doable thing. Yeah. Who's your favorite soccer team? Uh, Arsenal. Okay. Yeah. Do you know, do you know who, do you okay. know where Arsenal is? Okay, cool. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. So I've been to a few Arsenal games, but never, never been around the media team, unfortunately. Yeah. So that, that's another, that's another bucket list thing. Yeah. Maybe it's just sending a DM, shooting your shot next time you're over there. It might have to be. Yeah. The, the, the last couple times that I've been, um, I hadn't had the time to be able to like, work on that because I feel like that's something that I'm going to have to work on maybe more than just a DM. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see like that. That is something that I, that I'm going to work on because that's, that's a, that's more doable than to shooting on a runway. I think. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. Does that, does that runway shoot like shooting with a model on an yeah, air, like shooting yeah. airplanes from the tarmac type thing? Yeah, no, no shooting like a model. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that'd be sick though. Like, yeah. Cool, It'd be cool. Like I, I, I envision it having like, like booking the lights in the background as it's turning to like blue hour or sunset or something like that. Yeah. So. And would you like just thinking with that? Would you are you talking about like a major airport, or would you ever do like a doesn't more have local to be. airport? Yeah, it doesn't that have would probably to be. more like it'd be easier to pull off, yeah. likely. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. still, <laughs> still, I, I'm I, I'm gonna work on it. But I mean, like that's something that's not not in the immediate future. Yeah, it's bucket list for a reason, mm -hmm. ideally. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I want to talk about urban exploration. Let's do it. So for anyone that doesn't necessarily know what that means, can you kind of explain it? Um, I think it's um, people explore nature all the time. They go on hikes. It's like urban hiking. Okay. <laughs> um, so people, they go to different places, I guess. Um, it doesn't have to be climbing a building necessarily. 
Um, it could be going into an abandoned mall, for example. It could be some people travel through the um, New York undergrounds, um, or for me, it was it was climbing buildings. Um, but it's yeah, it's just exploring urban areas that most people don't get to see because it, it it's pretty illegal. Yeah, and yeah. so like when you say like climbing buildings, you're not like strapped to the outside, not scaling, right? The outside like, of it. Um, sometimes, like if you're climbing a construction site or something like that, you have to like climb a crane, which is basically like scaling a building. Yeah, sure. Um, but now for the most part, it's just finding a way to get to the top how, inside. How, how do you get involved in something like that? I was just obsessed with it when I was doing it in England and, and in Paris. Um, I thought it was super cool. And I, one thing that I am obsessed with is getting shots that people don't usually get to see. And what better way to do that than I've been exploring? Um, because, I mean, there's a, a handful of people that do it in every city, but um, that as as a percentage of the amount of photographers that take photos of other stuff is is pretty small. Um, so I involved myself with it by shooting my shot again. Like I just reached out to people um, and they were just gracious enough to take me because I was interested. Yeah. And so like, is that part of the appeal then of doing it? Like you want to get those shots that no one can get, but it's also, like you said, extremely illegal. Yeah. So is it like talking about like is there like a rush with doing it by like trying to get these places that you're not supposed to be and getting those shots like yeah I, I honestly I was less obsessed with um the act of actually doing it and and more obsessed with the outcome of having photos that people won't have like it's pretty unique and that's what that's why I continued to do it for for a long enough time um but it's to me now um I talked actually in London with one of my friends about this um, it's just not worth it anymore. Yeah. The risk associated with it is pretty high. And at the time, I didn't care, and I probably should have, um, because I was in school and would have been probably deported if I would have been arrested or anything like yeah, that. Sure. Um, so I, I should have cared, didn't, but now I definitely do care, and it, it, it's not worth it to me anymore. No? Is no. there anyone that would could get you back to doing it ever again? Like, is there one place where someone's like, yo, I have opportunity to go do X? Like, would you ever consider it? Like, I consider it, but it's it's not something I'm seeking anymore. Yeah. So, I, I, like, I'm still friends with all the people that I, that I went up on rooftops with. Um, but it would take probably one of them or I follow, still follow a few urban explorers. It would take one of those guys to to get me there, but it's not something I'm, I'm looking to do necessarily. Yeah. So if someone comes to you and they're wanting to do urban exploration, yeah. what do you say to them? Are you like, man, it's not worth it? Or like, what, what do you land on if someone's asking? I usually tell people, and like, I, this is kind of something I tell people for, for anything is um, do it, but then be realistic with the possible outcomes as well. Like getting caught is honestly not that likely, but the chance that you do get caught is there's some real ramifications with that. Like, and, and I'm just upfront and honest with them. I said, I'm not, never going to stop you, but just know what you're doing. And I try to detail that as much as, as much as possible. Yeah. I remember the first thing that, um, when I was in Paris this is the first time I ever did it. I met this guy named Louis. Um, and he met me in like, I would never met this guy in my life. And he told me the very first thing he told me was, by the way, if, if we get caught, we're going to jail. And I had just made this guy travel all the way out from like the outskirts of Paris to, to come here. So I was like, well, that's unsettling, but I'm going to do it anyway now because this guy traveled all the way here. And it ended up being like, that was probably one of the coolest experiences of my life was uh, catching Paris uh, from a rooftop um, for sunrise. But uh, that first sentence was a bit unsettling and uh, it really sent my heart racing a little bit. What are some other places you've done urban exploration? Um, mostly just Paris and London. Mm -hmm. I think I don't even I don't think I've done it anywhere else. Maybe New York, yeah. but not nothing that I can recall in New York. Uh, mostly just Paris and London. A lot in Paris. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any other kind of crazy stories from that time when you're doing urban expo urban exploration? I think just like there was nothing bad that really happened, so there's nothing that I can really tell you. But it was just crazy to me how this would happen like the way that the, the way that it happens in Paris is like all of the buildings are pretty old in Paris um and so these guys would just get 
codes to apartment buildings and go to the top of them. They would just like watch people put in codes and that's how they get up. And there's no, there's no like lock picking, like no, they just wait for people to walk into a building. Um, I remember there was one, there was actually one time where we just saw a door open and the guys were like, let's go, let's go, let's just check it out and see what it's like. And we were walking up the stairs and the, the guy, I guess there was some sort of delivery guy, stopped us and like, what are you guys doing? And we all had our cameras out, so we were, we were like, uh, nothing. And he's like, get out. So it was just like random stuff like that. And uh, when I was in London, it was I was climbing a construction site. So I asked the guy how he found out like that this was climbable. And he's like, I just Googled it. And I was like, oh, all right. So and, and we ended up having to go to the outside of this thing and wait on a really busy street in London until nobody was on the street and nobody was looking and hop the fence. Once you were in, it wasn't really like that nerve wracking, but that waiting process and like booking it across the street and jumping over this construction wall was pretty nerve wracking. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Did you ever do anything underground? No, no, no. I, I don't want to get hit. I didn't want to get hit by a, like a train or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, that wasn't that wasn't for me. I was, and you know what's funny is that I'm actually not the biggest fan of heights, okay. so I probably should have started with underground stuff. But no, I, I didn't do anything like that. But talk to me about the LA trip now. Yeah, LA was something else, man. Can you explain who went, what, how that whole thing came to be? Sure. So, I, like, I have a I have a basic group of people that I talk to all the time um, that that's into photography. So. Um, that would be like my friend Nick, um, Emily, Saeem, and Vanith. Um, we always have a group chat going. We always bounce ideas off of each other. But we try to travel with each other as much as we can too because we pool our resources, we pool our contact lists, all that kind of stuff. Um, and we decided to go to L.A. together um, minus Nick. Nick couldn't make it, unfortunately. But the four of us um, just got a place in West Hollywood we went to LA and it was primarily a shooting trip with like, it, it was for photographers. So it was, um, shoots all the time, lots of good food, um, and meeting a bunch of really crazy people. So that like, that was probably the highlight was meeting, uh, a lot of people that I didn't think I was going to meet. Cause I know we talked about before about shooting your shot and all that kind of thing. Um, and I reached out to a ton of people and a lot of people got back to me, but I didn't shoot with a single person that said yes before, Interesting. which was fine because I ended up meeting a lot of very cool people that I shot with anyways. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't meet a single person that I had reached out to before. So that was interesting. Yeah. So the entire plan of that trip though, is just to shoot with people. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. I mean like I, I got some landscape shots, but the majority of it was to network and yeah. in, in a creative sense kind of network. Yeah. And so how long were you there for? I was there for 10 days. 10 days. Yeah. It's like run me through day by day. Cause you yeah, yeah. So like it, that from a planning standpoint, it was pretty unorganized, uh, to be honest with you. Um, we didn't really ever have an idea of what we were sorry. We had an idea of what we wanted to do, but we didn't know what days we were planning on doing everything. Um, so as far as walking you through, it's kind of like we didn't have any clue what we were doing. Um, we did the first day that we got there, we went to the L.A. River. Um, so if you've ever played Grand Theft Auto, you've probably driven through it. Um, that was pretty cool. And uh, we got shown around the city by uh, a couple of friends that the rest of the crew uh, made last time they were in LA. And uh, Tommy and Tyler were the, were the two guys that kind of showed us around and, and they brought us to a lot of the places where the public doesn't usually go to shoot or the, at least people that travel there. So that was nice. Again, more of the unique um, photos than other people have kind of. And um, so yeah, first day was LA River and that was super fun. Kicked it off, kicked off the trip really nicely. And uh, it was just a lot of shoots back to back, meeting a lot of different people and that's pretty cool people. It was, it was a lot of fun. Who are some of the highlights? Like, I have a couple written down here that I know you met. Who do you have? I wrote down Lil Huddy, yeah. Avani. I couldn't remember his name, so I wrote down Realtor. Yeah, yeah, Jasper. <laughs> Jasper. And yeah. then I also, you mentioned that you didn't shoot with them, but you saw like Logan Paul and Mike and Lele Pons and I that did. crew. Yeah, so um, Lil Huddy was actually the day of the LA River. Okay. Um, so we, we went with Tommy and Tyler and the rest of that crew, but when we got there, um, 
I guess it was pure coincidence, but their friends were also at the river right about to go shoot. Um, and so when we got there, I actually knew nothing about TikTok. Um, and I didn't know who Lil Huddy was at the time. Met him. He was a nice guy. Um, but they went off and shot their TikToks and we went off and did like our portrait shoot. And, um, yeah, like I had no idea who he was until I looked him up after. And then I was like, damn it, I should have tried to get photos of him. And that's actually something uh, myself and Emily, one of the the girls who was there on the trip, we talked about this recently. Like, damn, we really wish that we would have shot with Lil Huddy. Yeah, cause um, he's massive now. And he's blowing up so much. Like, and him, so he's now like dating Charlie, Charlie D'Amelio. D'Amelio. Yeah. And like, it's just insane. Like TikTok's yeah. just a whole other world. I know. I know. So that that was cool. I mean, I didn't really get to to say a whole lot to him, but seemed like a nice enough guy. Um, and I'll probably reach out to him if I ever go back. Just yeah. Just saying, hey, uh, trying to shoot my shot again. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you have that like maybe not. It's like I'm sure he's meeting up hundred people a yeah. day right now. Yeah. But like, there's a chance he remembers yeah. you, right? It just increases your chances. Yeah. yeah. I'm. I actually spotted one of his TikToks that I'm in. Like, oh, just from being there. Yeah. Like he just like panned. Like I'm not. I'm not like a. A main person. I'm like an extra yeah. in his TikTok. Um, but yeah, I spotted one of them. So I'd probably just send him a link to that and say, hey, I was in this. Yeah. Let's shoot. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Just to add like a personable like approach to it. I always try to do that as much as possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, it makes it better, right? Yeah, definitely. And um, then Avani is another person off TikTok yes. that you actually shot with her though, Yeah, right? so we, um, that, when we met um, Lil Huddy and those guys, one of the guys, I guess the mutual connection ended up coming out for dinner with us after when we, when we finished shooting. Um, and he told us if you guys aren't doing anything tomorrow, um, we're doing a shoot for, for a clothing line, uh, for actually Chase Keith, who was another, um, um, TikTok star. Okay. Um, and I guess he manages him. So they were doing a shoot for that. And I guess because Chase Keith and Avani were friends, they got Avani to, to come, uh, with her friend Amelie. And, um, yeah, I met Avani again. I was not into TikTok, so I didn't realize how big she was until I actually just asked her for her Instagram and I went and I looked and I was like, holy crap. It's like, and, and she was super cool. I would have never known if, um, I mean, I guess I didn't look at her followers, but yeah, like that was super surreal. She was very nice. She went super well and, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Talk to me about, was it, I think shortly after that is when you met up with Jasper. Yeah. So right after that, we, we were, this food seems to be the thing that brings a lot of people together, but we ended up, uh, meeting somebody that my friend Emily knew from Paris that I actually helped her introduce. Like I introduced them indirectly and, um, but I had never met him. And so we all kind of went and we, we had, uh, we had some food together and he was there with his friend Jasper and that's how the whole story came about with, with Jasper. And, um, I didn't think anything was going to happen from that. I mean, like it was a nice interaction, like met met these really cool people. Didn't really expect to see them later in in the trip, but little did I know something, something was coming. So what happened was we, we met, we parted our ways and then we got a text a couple of days later, uh, from Jasper. And he said, Hey, like I'm looking to shoot some content for one, this house and two, the clothing brand that, um, that his friend Oscar was, was in charge of. And, um, he said, would you like to come shoot some content at these houses? And he sent us a couple of links and I didn't think anything of it at first, but I clicked on the links and the links were for one $14 million house and one fourteen and a half million dollar house. So we naturally picked the fourteen and a half million dollar house. And we went and shot some content there. And um, that was wild because it was something that like, even if you know people, you don't expect that to happen. And I barely knew this guy and he had trust in us and he liked our work enough to reach out to us. And um, I'm super thankful for that. It was such a fun day. And, and uh, yeah, thank you, Jasper. Yeah, no kidding. That's unreal. Yeah. And so you also, again, you didn't collab with Logan Paul, but you saw him and kind of that crew at a I restaurant did. one night, right? I did. at Catch LA. It's a, like a famous bar. Okay. Yeah. Um, that was just, I, I was in the, um, I guess it would have been like a balcony area had it been warm out, but they had it all boarded up. So we were out there and I had the view of facing into the restaurant. And I kid you not, like directly in front of me, probably like 
30 feet away, I saw Logan Paul and I actually told my friend Emily, I said, uh, hey, do you recognize that guy? Like just this guy over here. And I knew exactly who it was and I knew she knew who it was, but she turned around and she was like, that's Logan Paul. Oh my God. She started freaking out. And cause she's like very into um, the whole YouTube space and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so she started freaking out about it and she actually knew Lele Pons, yeah. um, who was also there. And so that was pretty cool. We, we just saw them. It wasn't, I didn't want to go up and like mm-hmm. invade their personal space. Cause I feel like they get that a lot and sure. I didn't want to do that to them. But um, yeah, yeah that, that was pretty cool. Did you, did, I, did you like notice anybody that spotted them and like went up and talked to them or were they able to kind of eat? I think I saw like one or two, but they were there the whole time we were there. So we were like an hour and a half and it wasn't too bad. Like I think they, for the most part, were left alone as far as I can serve. Yeah. yeah. I'm always just curious about like life in LA, right? Because I feel like it's very different. Yeah, it is. I like I, I, if they were to come here, then people would be all over it. But I think the people in LA are just so conditioned to, I use the term famous lightly, but popular people um being around them all the time that it just isn't as wow as them being in ottawa and it being the same thing yeah are there any other people or any other experiences from la that i don't have written down that you think would be interesting um we the my favorite actually experience above everything even the stuff that we talked about was the day that we rented a mustang and drove down the pacific coast um and it was kind of just because it was like it, it was the one thing that felt like a vacation on my vacation. Even though we did shoot, um, it was a beautiful sunset. Uh, we drove down the coast, listened to some music, and met up with um, Tommy, one of the guys that I had told you about before. And we just went to this beach, and we watched the sunset on the beach. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, man, it was just, like, the one time that I got to kind of relax and, and just shoot, but at the same time do it, do it in a more, at more my own pace. So, like, that was probably the best. Went to a Clippers game. Nice. Yeah, saw Kawhi. I wore a Raptors Kawhi jersey to the game. Nobody said anything. I thought I was going to get a lot of talking to for that, but yeah. nothing on that. So okay. thankful for that. Yeah. But talking about like the vibe in LA, because I've heard, because like from your experience, mm-hmm. it sounds like it was very positive and like you met a bunch of dope people that introduced you to more people and it was sweet. But like I've heard the opposite often yeah. when it comes to LA where people are very closed off and they're very much pushing their own mm-hmm. agenda and when you're trying to talk to them they kind of are like what do you want from me type yeah. situations like what was your experience in terms of that I still definitely saw that like it was very apparent um you kind of have to get, take it all with a grain of salt like everything that everybody says um usually people are trying to push some sort of agenda like you said everybody's trying to flex connections or flex money or possessions or fame anything like that Um, and I think I lucked out because I went with the three other photographers and I think Emily and Saeem had already been there before. Um, so they kind of did a lot of the weeding out of people. So the, the, the core people that I met and spent most of my time with were not like that at all. Um, and I just got lucky having known people beforehand. Um, but it's still very apparent. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of like the vibe complete 180 talk to me about the creator space in ottawa Mm. yeah it's not uh not my favorite place to be creatively uh it's getting better i think but from a from a creative standpoint ottawa is pretty slow behind other places i just think people are closed off in terms of um doing creative work together and um i mean that's not a great mentality to have if We want the city to succeed together. Um, I find a lot of people like working on their own and doing their own thing and um, not the best for creating a creative environment. Yeah. Why do you think it is like that here? (sighs) I don't know, man. I think if I knew that, I would be able to try and work to make it better, but I just, I don't even know what to do. And and like, I don't hate Ottawa by any means. Um, I love it. I've was born here i will always represent it positively um but from a creative point of view it's just it's not the best for like fostering a creative in general i don't think and that that goes for photography that goes for every other creative space i just i wish people had more of an open mind about working together and um i'm i'm always like that's one thing that i'm always open to is working with other people if somebody comes to me i'm gonna reply every single time unless it's something silly 
obviously. But um, I'm never going to say no because there are so many people that have said yes to me mm-hmm. that didn't have to that I feel like I have every right to say to other people, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to work together or I can answer your question. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's all I know how to do right now to help make Ottawa better. But yeah. it's kind of depressing sometimes. But from your experience, like you find it like collaborating has been tough. Yeah, especially, well, it's getting it's getting better, but I don't know whether that's because I'm getting better and people are cool with the stuff that I put out now or whether the community is getting better. Yeah. Um, because when I started, I reached out to, like like I did with all the, the people that are better in business, I did that for photography and I reached out to like eight or nine people in Ottawa and basically said, I don't know what I'm doing, but I see your work and I like it. And I was wondering if you could help me. Um, and I, I reached out to those people and probably only two, two replied. Um, and I've actually had a few of them that didn't reply now reach out to me asking me if I want to work with them. So it's kind of funny. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's full circle. Um, I'm, I don't hold anything against them for that. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody deals with that kind of stuff differently. But um, yeah, it was tough at the beginning and that kind of discouraged me. But at the same time, motivated me mm-hmm. to like get to the point where that doesn't become a thing anymore. Yeah. And so do you think it's more so like similar type creators when it comes to collaborating, like photographer to photographer, you find it tough? Like I've had, I wouldn't say like an opposite experience of you, but I've had a more of a positive experience, I would mm-hmm. say. But I think it's because when I reach out to collaborate with someone, I'm not trying to, like I'm basically giving them a platform to talk about themselves for like an hour. Mm-hmm. So I've yeah. pe- found people are more willing to do that, That's I true. think. Like do you think it's more so like, if we're like in the same industry, I don't want you to like get ahead of me. I think, think it's competitive. Kind of it? Yeah. yeah. Cause I've had a few times and like when I've put on photography shows and stuff like that, people with what I call significant Ottawa fame, um, come in and, and they know that they're like that. And I just, I just don't like that mentality. And, but, I, but I do, I do think, I think it is to do with the fact that we're in the same space and it's a competitive mindset and that's, awesome but I think we can all competitively succeed together some of us are going to be more successful than others and I am aware of that but I'd rather the whole city be better than me blow up and only me and the rest of Ottawa be crappy Mm -hmm. yeah and at the end of the day too like if you're worried about giving someone tips because you think eventually they'll be better than you if they're that good they're going to be better than you anyways yeah right yep so and and I think like yeah uh, to your point people are probably going to find those answers regardless. You're just kind of making it more difficult when you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're burning that bridge and yeah. Yeah. And I like, like I said, I don't hold anything against the people that didn't say anything back to me, but I'm eternally grateful for the people that brought me on right away because it made that transition to being a better photographer a lot easier. Um, and kudos to, to those people got a long way. I've come a long way from then too. Yeah. I used to be really, really bad. But I actually have all of those photos still up on my page. I just, I keep it there as a reminder. Yeah. But I also want to ask you, kind of along the same vein you mentioned there when you do shows and stuff, like people sure. with, as you described, like Ottawa fame will come yeah. in. How have you noticed someone with a significant following in Ottawa acts versus someone in a different city? That's the thing is I feel like um, when I go to London or something like that, I meet up with people that have four or five more times the following um they seem like regular people so i i i feel like it's just a product of the city that you're in um if you're in london and you have a couple hundred thousand followers that's cool and all but you still have to be more than that to succeed um so i feel like people are just more accustomed to it because they live in a bigger city and ottawa is just it's it's not a creative haven at the moment um and so when people do succeed to a certain point, I think kind of just gets to their head because nobody else has that in the city. Mm-hmm. Whereas in London, everyone has that. Yeah. So it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, I definitely think that's it, right? Where it's like you don't see as many b- like bigger creators here. Mm-hmm. So when all when it does happen, I, under- I understand yeah. where it comes from. But yeah. uh, what what's interesting too is a lot of people that do succeed creatively end up moving out of Ottawa. Yeah. So that kind of sucks too. And so when, uh, yeah, I don't know. Is that something you'd like to see change where people stick around? Yeah, honestly, I like I as much as I'd love to to live in England, I think eventually I'll come back here and I would I would like to live here. 
um, if work and all that kind of stuff allows for it, um, yeah, I would, I would stay in Ottawa. Um, but I, I, I do think it's an issue. It's not, and that I'm, that part I can't control, and I don't think that anybody should stay to fix that, but um, it's just a product of the environment. It's tough, especially like being a creative when there's not much in that field. Like there yeah. is, but like when yeah. you go to a city like Toronto or even Montreal, like there's just so much more opportunity mm-hmm. there. So it's like I understand why people leave, but then it's like how do you break that cycle of people leaving where if you're trying to make people stay to foster that community, but there's nothing here now. So it's like it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, it's almost like a like a sports team that's trying to rebuild. Trying to get players to stay in a in a city is is tough if everyone just if the turnover rate's pretty high. I just, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I think like w- one thing that you said that I really agree with is the, the like for like competitiveness. Um, because in Ottawa, like when I reach out to like models and stuff, they're so down to, to collaborate. But it's when I reach out to photographers outside my immediate group that I kind of run into um, problems trying to, not even problems. It's not a problem that they don't want to work or whatever, but I'd rather work with people than not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. But yeah, it's just a cool conversation to have. It's always interesting to see everyone's opinions on the yeah. creative space, especially living in this city. And it's like always good to kind of get those different perspectives because I've never really talked to anyone about this, so it was cool. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I enjoy it. And I and it feels like I'm bashing it, but I really just want to see it be better. Um, and I'm trying to, th- I am trying to be proactive and finding ways to make it better. I'm not just saying, oh, Ottawa sucks and then not doing anything about it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put a real effort in 2020 into trying to do something to make Ottawa a little bit better or more open-minded about working together. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. But so like with that in mind, like what's next for you? What do you have coming up? Website. Website's next. Website's next. It's coming out. Um, I don't know when it is coming out. <laughs> I, I've actually just kept telling people two weeks, but I tell them that so often that it just, I don't even know when it is anymore. But I've taken so long on it that I just want to, take the full time and make sure that I get it right before I do release it. But it's pretty much there. It exists already. It's up, but I want to tweak it before I publicize and stuff like that. So that's the first thing. Um, next I want to, I want to start getting into more sports photography. Um, so I can work towards that, that goal of shooting for Arsenal one day. PSG. Um, and yeah. I like the guy from yeah, PSG. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so that's, that's something I'm going to start to try and get into, but, no major projects as of right now just what, just the website yeah what about like ultimately like long-term goals i don't know man i don't honestly like because i don't think i really treat it like a business it's not something i'm thinking about what if it just like not even necessarily photography specific like just life long term oh that's a good question um hmm. i'm pretty content with the way things are right now but at the same time i want to make sure that I'm always learning stuff. So I think it just goes back to continuing to reach out to all those people that we talked about earlier, um, both locally and shooting my shot with bigger people. Um, so I, like from a happiness standpoint, I like where I'm at. Um, from a career standpoint, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty new into full-time work. Um, so that's progressing. And I mean, if it becomes an issue, then I'll, I'll, I'll set a goal for it. Um, but I think it's just going to be about staying on top of learning because I think it's all important to continuously learn. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome, man. But before we wrap up, I ask everyone the same standard set that's of it. questions. Yeah. I used to call it rapid fire, but they're definitely not rapid fire questions. Okay. And then I started calling it Q and a, yeah. but I'm, but then I was like the whole podcast is a Q and a, <laughs> like, how is that different? Yeah. So I don't okay. really know what this is called, it's but okay. the first one is yeah. you're going to dinner. Mm-hmm. You can take three people. Yeah. It could be anybody dead or alive. Who do you take to dinner? Hmm. Um, number one is Frank Sinatra. Okay. I'm like, I'm really into hip hop and rap and stuff. But the one person that I will listen to that's not that is Frank Sinatra. And just having looked at, back at his life and seeing all the things he accomplished, but also all the things he got himself into, seems pretty interesting. I'm also Italian, so I'm kind of biased in terms of that. Um, but his whole lifestyle just seems like a, something that I would love to ask him about. Um, Barack Obama would be number two. I think he, like, on the point of learning, I feel like I would learn so much from having a conversation with Barack. But at the same time, he's not somebody that we can't, like, talk about sports with like 
Yeah. At the same time, I could ask him what he thought about the Raptors winning the championship last year. Um, so, like, yeah, somebody I would learn from, but at the same time, I wouldn't be a dull conversation either. Uh, last one. Maybe Michael Jordan. I haven't really thought about the last one, but I think becoming the first, like, sports player to kind of build a brand or have a brand deal mm-hmm. and build something around you like that, I would just want to ask him about that. And I also love, obviously, how he played and how dominant he was at the sport. So from a marketing point of view and from a from a sports point of view, I'd, pr- I'd probably bring him too. That's fair. Yeah. What is some of the best advice you've ever gotten? Something from my dad, I think. And at the time he was talking about hockey, but I apply to everything now. Um, and he says, you don't have to be the best, but you have to try to be the best. And that's kind of why, how I apply um, my mindset to everything now. And like we talked about before, me hating being busy, but hating being unproductive. And I think if I'm not trying to be the best, then what am I really doing? When, when you wake up in the morning, yeah. what motivates you to get up and out of bed? Ooh, knowing that I have to be productive. Yeah, I think it's... I think it's it's as simple as like I don't want to feel like I'm not doing what I could be doing and uh, maximizing my potential every day. And sometimes it doesn't happen and that's totally cool. But yeah, being as productive as possible. What's one thing about you people wouldn't expect? Oh, man. Um, Probably that I'm shy. Like I do enjoy a lot of time by myself. Like like I'm kind of like an extroverted introvert, although I don't know how people use that term. Um, yeah, like I'm pretty open and stuff on social media, but at the end of the day, like when I turn my phone off and stuff like that, like I like time to recharge and just do my own thing. Um, and I think with social media existing, not a, like that's not apparent to people. Like it, you just assume that everybody's outgoing. And I am, but at the same time, if like at a party that I don't know anybody, I'm, just, I'm pretty quiet. Yeah. What's one thing that's so important everybody needs to know Hmm. that's a great question um i think people need to really realize that you should be doing what you love and i like that's everybody says that but um i've really found that out through through doing video especially um loving what you do is makes everything so much easier um and you just have to learn to work with that and learn to kind of make that a thing, but it's different for everybody. Um, But explore that for sure. For the final question, I like to flip the script a little bit. Let's do it. So instead of me asking the question, it's you asking the question. Okay. But it's not to me. So pretend you have a crystal ball and you could ask this crystal ball any question and you'll get the answer. What is one question you'd want to know the answer to? Oh, one question I would want to know the answer to. That's a great question. (sighs) Probably... Damn, this is a really good question. And it's the last one. Oh, uh, what would I? I would want to know what the world would look like if there were no social media platforms. Interesting. Yeah. As much as I, I, I'm literally here because that's what I do. Um, if it didn't exist, I wouldn't be upset. To be honest with you. Um, and so like, I just would want to know what it would be like. I mean, you can kind of look back and see what it was like to an extent, yeah. but I understand in the context of your question, like what would it look like today if yeah. there was still no social yeah, media? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I don't know that answer. Um, but I think that that's something I would want to know. I'm just curious. I'm a curious person yeah. and yeah. Yeah. No, I totally, I understand where you're coming from. Cause I'm always like, if, uh, like whenever people ask, like, if you go back to any decade, which one would you go? And I always think I'd go back to the nineties Yeah. cause like I was alive then, but I was still so young that yeah. I like. I was only three by the end of the Mm nineties that like, but it was still like people were almost like, I don't want to use the word naive, but it was just like an interesting time. Like the technology was coming, but it wasn't there yet. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah. I I think like it's, I find it super interesting. People are literally becoming famous because they're on social media. What would we be doing differently and what would exist? Cause something else would probably exist that, that we would be utilizing more, but like, I'm just curious of what that would might be. Like, I don't know. I think about that sometimes. Yeah. No, it's an interesting question. And no one's ever asked. I'm always curious. That's my favorite yeah. question is the last one. Because yeah. I never know what direction people will take yeah. it in. And no one's taking it. You can't be that. prepared for it, right? Yeah. No, because yeah. no one no one asks yeah. that question, right? It's a weird yeah. question that yeah. I ask. So awesome, man. But I want to thank you for taking the time to be on the podcast. Thanks I for wanna, having me. I appreciate it. My pleasure, man. I want to give you the floor. So where can the people find you? Plug everything and anything you got. 
Okay, so you can find me on Instagram at Jay McDonald. Um, you can find me on YouTube at Jay McDonald as well, uh, Jordan McDonald too. And um, yeah, that's it for now. It, my website is going to be coming out soon. It's going to be www.jaymcdonald.com. Awesome, man. Well, I want to thank you once again for being on the podcast. I want to thank everybody for listening. Whether you've listened the entire way through, you've only listened to bits and pieces. I really appreciate you taking time to check this out. Guys, do me a favor. Go and follow Jordan on Instagram. I'll make sure everything is linked in the show notes down below. And if you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at, at the Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. And if you'd like to follow the podcast, you can find us on Instagram at, at my social life podcast or on YouTube by searching up my social life. Thank you once again for listening, everybody. We'll talk soon.